gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our virtual cultural exchange between Morocco and Gibraltar. This event is organized by the Straits of Gibraltar Association, of which Mr. Ibrahim Krikas is president. I am Henry Sacramento, your host this evening. Just to remind our viewers that they have questions to our guests. Yes, guests, we have two tonight. Let me introduce both of them. The first one, born in Gibraltar, educated at Bayside Comprehensive and West Sussex Institute of Higher Education, reading geography and education. He taught in Bishop Fitzgerald's Middle School from 1982 to 2008. He was head of geography at Westside Comprehensive 2008 to 2015. President of Gibraltar Teachers Association between 1992 and 1995. At various times, Vice President, Secretary and Captain of the Mediterranean Rowing Club. He is bronze, silver and gold award holder of the Duke of Edinburgh's award. Expedition leader and assessor for Gibraltar Award. Former council member, Gibraltar National Award Council, organized various events, including the award exhibition and Gibex 2001 in conjunction with visits by the late His Royal Highness Prince Philip the Duke of Edinburgh, founder of Award in 1996, and His Royal Highness Prince Edward, Duke of Wessex, 2001. We welcome Mr. Kenneth Gaulona. Our second guest, in search of a new pastime, which had to be related with exercise and keep in shape, it was his colleague, Mr. Kenneth Gaulona, who actually introduced him into hiking and trekking in the early 90s. It was not until the year 2001 when the Duke of Edinburgh Award was organizing the International Gold Award Gibex 2001 to be held in Cortes, southern Spain. Michael Pizarello and Mr. Kenneth Cardona asked him to join the team as staff support to help oversee the event. Since then, and after experiencing Gibex 2001, he has always been extremely eager to spread the word and prompt the award to the younger generations. It has taken well over 50 years for the Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme to be fully established in Gibraltar. He is very focused and enthusiastic that with his friend and colleague, Kenneth Cardona, together with the priceless team of excellent and efficient people that compose the Straits of Gibraltar Association, they will make it happen in Morocco too. We welcome Mr. John Napoli. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Henry. How are you? Oh. Henry, we've lost your voice. Yeah. Well, have it, we can't hear Henry, I'm afraid. But anyway, if anybody else can hear me, hello, uh, pleased to meet you, delighted to be on the show. Yeah. Hello? <clears throat> I imagine John he'll be coming back in a moment. Hopefully. Okay. Maybe his internet connection is not that good. Possibly. Possibly. Hello. So I, uh, uh, hello, Henry. You seem to be stuck. Mm. Hello, Kenneth. I can hear you now, Henry. I yeah. can hear you. John, can you hear us? John? John, are you with us? No, I don't think John can. Uh, hello, John. John. Uh, cannot 
hear you. Well, whilst Carry we on. try, whilst we try to uh, get John back, so Kenneth, did. let yeah, me ask ahead. you. Well, no, firstly, what an honour to have you and John, of course, this evening here. Tell me, Kenneth, what was it like growing up in Gibraltar with a close border? Yeah, no, uh, Henry. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be on the show. <laughs> let's, let's, so the honor is mine, not yours. Okay. <laughs> what was it like to live in Gibraltar during the close frontier days? When, remember, Henry, uh, if I can just take you back in time, the frontier actually closed when I was just about 10, 1969, about 10. It didn't open again until 1985. No, uh, very limited in terms of experiences if you see what i mean no we were more or less confined to these 10 square kilometers so we couldn't really have much experience of anything outside shall we say gibraltar no if your parents were wealthy enough then you were able to afford to go away uh, to the united kingdom and I can remember at the time that most people used to spend their summer holidays in Morocco, if you remember, yes, uh, of which uh, one particular place, which is called Allen Village in Tangier, yeah, which... Uh, uh, we share uh, the same age, we are from the same school year, and yeah, uh, I live those uh, same experiences as you guys did. Uh, uh, and as you rightly say, we only had the ferry link the Monscalpe then, between mm. Gibraltar and Tangier, or mm. the one flight mm. to the UK. So as Maybe, you rightly uh, say, if, if you so were Henry, wealthy... Henry, yes? Henry, Henry, sorry to interrupt you, but just one anecdote for the benefit of the, the listener or the viewer or whatever it is, no? Uh, you mentioned the Duke of Edinburgh's award, and I started off with the Duke of Edinburgh's at, at uh, the age of 14, basically because it gave us opportunities to do things, no? Yes. A and very much one of the motives there was the fact that you could travel away from Gibraltar, no? As a group of friends or young people or whatever. It, you know, the, the anecdote really is that we had very little experience of certain things which people take for granted, okay? So we were doing the silver expedition uh, in a place called Thetford, Norfolk, in the United Kingdom. And um, in those days, uh, the assessment was very, very strict with things like uh, timings and being in particular places at particular, you know, at particular points in yeah. time, okay? Um, and we were walking along this lane, and believe you me, that people might think what how stupid this is, but this is absolutely true, no? We came across a cow for the first time, okay? Now, remember that a cow, if you remember rightly, was something that we had seen in a book. Yes. No? So we, Or in the uh, movies. Or in the movies, absolutely. But uh, I had no idea of what a real cow was like, you know? So um, we stopped by this lane and there was a wall and we were standing there looking at this cow in awe, no? Uh, look, a cow. Yeah. Uh, and obviously at some point in time, because we were late for the next waymark, the assessor came along looking rather annoyed and spoke to us and he said, why are you people not where you're supposed to be? And our answer was, there's a cow. <laughs> you can imagine the look on this man's face, thinking, "Where do these people come from?" Come no? from well, I tell a place you, where there are no cows. <laughs> exactly, exactly the same thing happened. Yeah. Um, I had never seen snow, so the first time I saw snow was when I lived in the UK, studying in college. You know, uh, and I remember that I saw this snow from the window of a of a seminar. I was in a tutorial and I kept looking out of the window at this white stuff which was falling from the sky, you know. And obviously the, the tutor realized that I wasn't paying attention, no. So he said, Kenneth, you know, he called my attention when I tried to concentrate on what he was talking, but I was more uh, amazed at what was happening outside the window, no. So eventually this man, he was a very clever man, obviously being a university lecturer, no cottoned on to the fact that I came from Gibraltar and we had never seen snow. 
So he actually invited me to go outside into the snow. Yeah, And remember that I was about 20 at the time. And there I was rolling in this white stuff, no, like a little kid. No, you know, that's just to give you a few anecdotes yeah. about what life in Gibraltar. Well, no, the time you saw time. snow at 20. I didn't yeah. see snow until I was 28 when the border was finally open, no? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. We're stuttering, I think, again. You saw snow before I did, and, and so, we seem to have lost John. I mean, the I platform seems to be playing. Hello, John, welcome back. But can you hear me, yeah? Yes, I can yes. hear you, yes, I can hear you. John, Kenneth has just shared with us a few anecdotes of what it was like growing up in Gibraltar with a close frontier. Can you share any with us? Of course. Well, we had been deprived from acceptable living conditions by the Spanish government of the day, and obviously we, we missed the, the, the expansion. But in Gibraltar, I think we adapted extremely well. We carried on with our lives, you know, and uh, what I can say on a positive note, that back in those days, the relations and links with Morocco were uh, simply thriving mm -hmm. and, uh, because we depended on our neighbors for the supply of maybe fruit and veg or fresh fish and above all uh, uh, 10,000 people labor workforce to cover for all the uh, jobs that the Spaniards had left you know um, so the Moroccan authorities were we have to be grateful to them absolutely extremely good on that front. And that is something that we Gibraltarians should never forget. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, um, I suppose you know that um, that as a people, as a community, it, it made us more resilient and strong. I used to see lots of unity and uh, uh, lots of neighborly feelings, you know, and, and Gibraltar was alive and active back in those days. And so many activities happening. Uh, we, we had everything, you know. So, so I think that we adapted extremely well, to tell you the truth. Gentlemen, let me throw a question at both of you. And Kenneth, if you can answer first. When did you know what you wanted to do professionally? When? Uh, Henry Mira. I, I won't lie. I won't say that I had this uh, uh, passion for uh, education or teaching as a child, no? But in a way, in a way, and that's an interesting question because what did actually make me start thinking of the fact that I might actually enjoy teaching, and if you don't mind me blowing my own trumpet, I was rather Please good do. at it. Please I was do. rather Please good do. at it, I think. Remember that I taught your, your son. No? Absolutely, and he has yeah. amazing memories of you as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit unorthodox, shall I say. No, eh? um, Basically, it goes back to the fact that when I was involved with the Duke of Edinburgh at gold level, and by that time I was about 17, I think it was, um, I started helping out by instructing with the expeditions. In other words, we were instructing younger participants with map reading and camp craft and things like that. No? And that, in a way, it sort of made me think, Mira, this is something that I might actually enjoy doing uh, as a career, you know? Um, the of thought course, of getting paid for doing something you enjoyed. See, si, well, uh, Henry, to, to be honest with you, at one point in time, I remember, and again, going back to the close frontier situation, that people of like me and perhaps John and, and many others, we were motivated by the fact that what we wanted to do was to leave Gibraltar and see the world, no? And, uh, and cut a long story short, at one point in time, I was helping out with, a, 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 like I said, with instructing the, um, the Duke of Ed, in the Duke of Edinburgh's ward. And my father and my uncle actually spoke to me one day and they said, and this is a word, eh? why don't you become a teacher? 
they finish work at quarter past four, they have five <laughs> months off a year, they get paid well. Emira Henry, that was probably the worst advice I'd ever heard. Because you didn't finish at four o'clock, you didn't have five months of the year, <laughs> and the pay was not particularly that brilliant either, if you see what I mean. Well, it wasn't bad. Nah, it was a livable wage, but I mean, yeah. there were other careers which were much better paid, no? Yeah? Okay, so that's your answer, basically. John, when did um, you know what you wanted to do? Well, you know, I, I decided to leave school at the age of 16. I, I wanted to work and earn a living, and I wanted to become financially independent from my parents. So I, I was lucky enough to um, apply for a course with Holiday in UK, uh, because I remember you working part time as a receptionist at the right, uh, right. Holiday Inn at the time, the Elias Hotel. Now, exactly, you know. So uh, I wanted to go into the hotel trade. So I was lucky enough, as Kenneth rightly said before, every everybody, practically everybody, wanted to to experience leave, leaving Gibraltar. You know. So I was lucky enough to leave for three years and undergo a training manager's course with UK. Uh, sorry, with Holiday Inns in UK. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I was there for about three years and came back with the age of 21. Left at about 17, and I was back at about 21. We have our first questions, yes. and it's, uh, it says, we are delighted tonight to have Mr. Kenneth and John during this unique and exclusive cultural exchange bridge between the Kingdom of Morocco and Gibraltar overseas British territory. It is our pleasure to learn from two long experiences of creativity that goes beyond the Mediterranean Sea, reaching Moroccan soil with a great initiative such Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, Moroccan version. Our dear guests tell us when the idea came from to suggest the award to the Moroccan youth. Okay. Who would like to answer that one? When I, I think I will, if you don't mind, John. Yeah, yeah. because uh, it was something that I was involved in from the very beginning. Uh, basically, what happened was that at one point in time, Stephen Marine approached me in Gibraltar and um, being retired at the time he he suggested to me or he asked me if I would mind helping the Straits of Gibraltar Association and the Gibraltar Morocco business exchange with cultural sporting youth links and whatever yeah um I mean, the honest answer is that as you know I do like Morocco quite a lot you know, and I visit regularly so um i met up with it was you. rather tempting you see when well yeah yeah um yeah and i met up with this gentleman who is no longer involved in the gmbe but i believe might still be a member of the straits of Gibraltar association and medi no and medi Arohi. Yeah? yeah and we had a chat one morning over a couple of co coffees and i suggested to them because i do really believe in the concept of what the Duke of Edinburgh's award is. No, I can explain that further if you like later on in the program. So I suggest to me that this is something that you might be interested in developing in Morocco. And then subsequent to that, I was asked to go back to give a talk. I was uh, present at that talk. You were today, present yes. in that yep. talk, no? Yeah. Uh, so where, I, where I explained a little bit about the history and the concept of the award uh, at an international level, no? Um, so I think it struck a chord with the people who were um, listening in to that talk, yeah, and, and I, I think what happened was, that, you know, this is something worth pursuing, you know, and, and then subsequently it sort of kicked off. Um, it went a little bit dorm, dormant, shall we say, during the pandemic, no? Um, yes. But then we had Saad coming 
on board. Yeah. And he was Slavin very Yacoum, keen. Yacoum, he's done yep. an excellent work. Absolutely. Gentlemen, let, let me let me yes. throw a question at you, which I yes. wanted to ask you before this question came on, which is, yes, sure. how did you first become involved with the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme yourselves? Uh, I know, Kenneth, you were 14. No, when you yeah. started. Yeah. That, that was because my brother was, my elder brother was involved, no? Right. Um, if, if you like, my elder brother was one of the originals that started the award. No, in I Gibraltar? Was, in Gibraltar, absolutely. He was one of what what year was that? Would you remember? Uh, Henry, we are probably talking 1973, 74, somewhere around there. I think yeah. I joined at 70 in 74, 75, no? But uh, like I said before, I, I could see my brother getting involved in all sorts of activities and doing this and doing that and going to the UK and what have you. And I thought to myself, Mira, this is something that I would like to do too, if you see yeah. what I mean, no? So that's how I got involved. In yeah. Yeah? John, when did yeah. you come become involved? Well, mm. as you very rightly said uh, in, in the introduction, you know, it was Michael Di Savello and Kenneth who actually uh, asked me to join them, you know, and and it was the best influence I've ever had, you know, because obviously uh, besides liking nature and liking, you know, hiking and trekking, you know, it, it, it was great to look after these kids, you know, uh, and, and I acted as support staff, uh, which I really enjoyed. We, we were at the Piedra de Grazalema for about a week. Wow. You know? So, uh, yeah. It's quite challenging, no? Yeah, absolutely, you know. So I got involved because of them too. You know, they were the ones that actually brought me in. Gentlemen, explain your role in the scheme. Uh, what do you actually do? Uh, bueno, uh, nowadays, you mean? Uh, bueno, throughout. I mean, what have you, what what have your roles been, and how have they changed? In my case, participant, uh, assistant instructor, instructor, expedition assessor, national council award member, with responsibility for um, what is the expeditions or adventurous journeys, as you call them now, no? Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, right now, I am not involved with the local award as such. Right. No. Okay. Uh, basically, because uh, I got involved in other activities, as you can, as you rightly said before, I became the president and what have you of the Mediterranean Rowing Club. Um, basically, because my children were involved with that, and being a parent, you 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 sort of get, you know, uh, okay. say you do. Inevitably, no. Yeah. Uh, and I'm the kind of person who, who is very. You dive in. <laughs> you know, dive in. Yeah, I was going to use the expression, but it's the wrong one, which is is easily led into something. No, you know, I can't just sit around and stand around watching. I've got to be involved in something. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's basically it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John and yourself. Um, I, I am not active in the Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme in Gibraltar. I'm, I'm fully focused in assisting Kenneth, you know, and sad, obviously. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting for the next one. So if, if sad is listening in, when is the oh, I'm, sh I'm sure that he is. I'm sure that he, he wouldn't miss tonight. So, Gentlemen, let me throw another question at you. Who has been the person that has influenced you the most, Kenneth? Uh, Mira, Henry, that's a difficult question to answer, and I don't want it to sound like a cliche, if you see what I mean, no? Mm -hmm. But different people have influenced me in different ways along the path of my life, shall yeah. we say. Mira, to begin with, I have to say my parents, obviously, no? They gave me an education in terms of making me the person that I am now, if you like, no? Uh, secondly, if you like, uh, uh, somebody like Kurt Hahn, who was obviously the person who founded the Duke of Edinburgh's award, he was an important educational uh, influence in me, no? Because 
I could see where he was coming from. And education is not just about, sorry, I, I don't want to give an, ed, an education lecture here, eh? but um, uh, he and I, we, we concur in the fact that education is not just about academia, if you see what I mean, no? Yeah. It's about holistic, it's about being holistic, it's about creating a better person to develop their strengths, no? And their skills. Their skills, character building, what have you, no? Confidence, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, name it all, you can name it all. And then, made apart from that, I, I have to say that were an important influence on me were two other people in my family. One was my uncle Pepe, who happened to be married to my uh, father's sister, yeah? And he had led a very interesting life, having fought in the Spanish Civil War with the international brigades, he told them, uh, and he, he was always full of uh, stories. Was, yeah, stories and experiences, which yeah. you, which I thought to myself, you know, as you grew up, you, uh, this man has had a very interesting life, you know, yeah? Mm. And then finally, finally, and he was my mother's first cousin, but more like a brother than a cousin, was the late Pepe Favre, who you know very well, obviously. Absolutely, he, yeah. he, he was a, a great... Uh, great dancer. A great dancer and a very charitable person and the perfect Absolutely. gentleman. Involved, involved in so many charities and uh, yeah. clubs and uh, mm -hmm. you know, who doesn't remember him involved with a saputeo, no? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, no, that's a different story. Pepe and the saputeo, to me at the time, was a, a great advantage because I used to get absolutely everything there was <laughs> going new, no? I think we've lost Henry there. He's coming back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tamo, did well, you hear that, I... Henry? You, yeah. you heard that, no? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, anyway, that, that is it. Different people. Gee. Ah, and I have to mention one other person. Sorry, Henry, I don't want to um, hog the conversation. No, 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 hombre. But uh, from another point of view, an important influence to me as a teacher was a person that you know, and that was Mario Arroyo. He was um, such a different kind of teacher to the one yeah. that I had experienced. If you don't mind, and, I, and even if you were to tell me that I was half as inspirational as Mario was in his career, that to me would be a great achievement. Absolutely. I, mm -hmm. I think Mario Arroyo has to go down in history as one of those teachers that influenced in a positive way so mm. many of us because mm. i was very fortunate enough to have him as form tutor for two years mm. uh, first and second year and i also had him as my drama teacher so mm. and and i count him amongst one of my best friends even mm. to date mm -hmm. uh, so yes i i concur mm. and i agree with you fully john we move on to you now mm. the same question who has been the person or the people that have influenced you the most? I would say my mom and dad. They always encouraged me and supported me to achieve my goals. And I must mention a few key friends who I have had for over 50 years, you know, and they've influenced me, you know, in many ways as well, you know. So, uh, yeah, uh, a few key friends and my mom and dad. They were the ones that have made the person that I am today, you know? Thank you, John. Uh, gentlemen, your most memorable moment with the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Kenneth, let's start with you. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the most the, memorable, eh? Uh, uh, um, bueno, the most memorable, apart from the gold expedition which I did in the Brecon Beacons, vale? Um, How old were you then? I was um, 18, 18, Mali. Si, pero mira, subsequent to that, one of the things that I subsequently learned was that part of the places or, or routes and, and climbs that we did over those hills in the Brecon Beacons and the Black Mountains, I subsequently learned that one of the places that I had been to is a place where the British Special Forces actually trained. 
yeah? wow. okay. ah. the Penny Van de Fandans, as they call it, no? Mm. And I had been to the top of that mountain, shall I say, no? Which is uh, a bit inspirational either way. The other thing memorable was getting a sort of a, an award, a Lifetime Achievement Award from His Royal Highness, the late Prince Philip, personally, yeah? Uh, that was a big wow. <laughs> yeah. Now, was that in Gibraltar? Because I remember attending mm -hmm. the gala dinner that was held at mm -hmm. the old, old casino mm -hmm. um, for the, and I think it was the 25th anniversary, if That's my right. memory That's doesn't right. fail me. Yeah. Uh, and both Priscilla and I attended that gala mm -hmm. dinner. That, what, mm -hmm. an, what an amazing occasion that was. See, to, that was to be there at the old mm -hmm. casino, mm -hmm. everybody dressed up in all, mm -hmm. and to actually witness seeing His Royal Highness in Gibraltar. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, when, from what I can remember, that was the first time that I had actually experienced a royal visit, you know, mm -hmm. and to have met uh, the founder of the award personally was quite uh, well, quite an experience, Henry, yeah. you know? Uh, I mean, the, the guy, whatever you, people thought about him, he was, he had a very quirky sense of humor. Yes. You know? A very quirky sense of humor, but uh, at the same time, he didn't come across as being, you know, uh, snooty or, or at, all. at all. He was very all, down to earth. Eh? Very, very down to earth, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. See, John. Well, your most yeah. memorable moment with the Duke of Edinburgh. I think when when I received the invitation from Michael Pizzarello and Kenneth to attend the uh, award presentation at the John Mack Hall with uh, Prince Edward, he came specially over to do that, you know. Uh, and not very long ago, with the with the kids in Chetan Park. You know, uh, I, it was a very satisfying and positive experience for me to see big smiles across the faces of those kids. You know, that is uh, priceless. Eh? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it was a great moment for me. You know, uh, one because we had already la launched the scheme and it was up and running, and secondly, to 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 share a, a precious moment with them. You know. Absolutely. One that we'll probably never forget. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. We have a question now from Reda Marrakesh. Very yeah. simple question. Tell us, dear guests, about out to Morocco and how it grows in you throughout the days and your experiences. Mm. Wow. It is a simple question. But not a simple answer, I'm afraid, Absolutely, Reda. Yeah. <laughs> this is quite involved. Um, Mira, uh, um, we had been to Morocco. The last time I had been to Morocco uh, was in 1983. Uh, and then the, the, the frontier opened and we started to look towards the north in Spain, which was unknown territory to us. You know? I think it was in about 2006 that uh, because we enjoy hiking, we actually thought about the fact of doing something different and going hiking to Morocco, okay? Uh, so we started doing that. Um, for my experiences in, in Morocco, when I'm in a, a very, <laughs> there are so many of them, but one is the fact that John and myself have actually climbed um, Tupcal, Together. I've done it. I've done yeah? it. And and wow. Is, that is a good experience. Eh? That and is an amazing experience. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. That was that was quite I think that was one of the the, the, the experiences in my life which I will never ever forget. You know? Very challenging. Uh, eh? Gee, no, it is. It is. It's not uh, it is quite a challenge. The other thing as you know is that I enjoy my motorcycle, you no? Know? Hence the t shirt. If you can see it, okay. <laughs> well, um, and I have actually been to Morocco now three times on motorcycle trips with some friends, you know, uh, which has allowed me to visit quite a number of places in Morocco. And I'm talking uh, Marrakesh, Agadir, Fez, Meknes, Rabat, Casablanca, Shepshawen, and 
numerous other places, no? Um, Mira, one of the things in answer to Reda's question is that what what attracts me really to Morocco is the um, the hospitality and the humility of the people that I meet. Yeah, yeah? which is something that I am afraid to say is being lost in Europe. If you see what I mean, no, it's yeah? lacking. See, it's been it's people it's eroded. See, see, see. Eroded it's is eroded, the word. Yeah. Eroded yeah, it's is eroded, the word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John, what about you? Well, um, since a very early age, Tangier has always not not necessarily in Morocco, but Tangier has always been in my heart. I mean, my mum lived there for about eight years throughout the war years, and she got educated in the Serrano, which still stands, you know, so it's it's very nostalgic for me, you know, plus the fact of the matter that by now, because we started going hiking to Morocco uh, back in 2005, 2006, around the Shepsawan area, before we actually hit the Tufgal in 2008, so it's special for me to go always because of its people, its tradition, the food as well plays a big part, mm. uh, you know, and uh, basically it's because of that, you know. I, I've uh, got thank a, you both. We a, Henry, if, yes. if you don't mind me interjecting, yeah. Yeah. we had this custom or this habit uh, pre the pandemic where we used to go and climb Jebel Musa at least once a year. Valley, you know, Jebel Musa, no, across the straits. And we had this habit of, or custom we had, of doing that at least once a year. Okay. John, we haven't been for three years. We've got three years worth of Jebel Musa hikes to catch up with. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we cannot really do long hikes. Anyway. Uh, well, you know, long hikes. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Gentlemen, how was supervising the young candidates in Morocco like? Uh, right. It was fine. Yeah, well, no, it, it was a, a novel experience, okay? Uh, like John said before, the, the, the thing that I took back from it most was the joy in those young people's faces, really. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> Well, we have a video which we're going to play now for our viewers to see how much fun you actually had. Mohammed, oh, whenever you're ready. <laughs> If you can move the highest mountains, cross the greatest oceans, and walk across the water. You feel defeated, falling on your knees and looking up for some hope tonight You try to stand up, but you throw your hands up Like you no longer have the strength to fight Cause you've seen too many sunsets, too many days Ending in the darkest night But on your own, you'll never know, you'll never know If you believe you can move the highest All you need is faith But it's almost like you lost your way Took a few wrong turns, took a few breaks Falling behind now, looking for grace Cause you need someone to lift you up, yeah Make right of the things you've done Cause on your own you'll never know, you'll never know If you believe you can move the highest mountains Cross the greatest oceans Walk across the water
say that all you need is faith But it's almost like you lost your way Took a few wrong turns, took a few breaks Falling behind now, looking for grace Cause you need someone to lift you up, yeah Make right of the things you've done Cause on your own you'll never know, you'll never know If you believe you can move the highest mountains Cross the greatest oceans Walk across the water Absolutely priceless. Yeah, impressive, impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The video says it all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Those faces, mm -hmm. and we also have to mention that uh, also included were a number of uh, teenagers with special needs, which was absolutely. very brave of, of them and the organizers to have actually taken them on the hike and the hike from what i hear was very successful in mm. spite of everything and of course we have to mention that there was a lot of help from the scouts from tetuan so thank, thank you, you very much to the group mm. of scouts from tetuan that helped yep. the the scheme to to be the success that, that it was uh gentlemen your comments on these images that you've just seen oh why not it's like i said like john has just uh, voiced you know uh, the video says it all. Look at the smile on those young people's faces, no? The teamwork involved. Um, what else can you say? Just watch the video, <laughs> really. It, it made it more challenging, you know, and satisfying. <laughs> You're both speechless, but there is somebody that would like to say something to you, and that is sad. Sad if we can have you on screen now. It is a great pleasure to have you today in our monthly cultural exchange. On this occasion, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and I would like to express how thankful I am for everything you have done so far for our independent award center. As an award leader, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation for Kenneth and for John Napoli for assisting uh, our process from the beginning, our process from the day one. Uh, I have no uh, words to, to, to express actually my, my feelings right now, but uh, I'm sure and I'm certain that uh, we wouldn't be where we are right now if uh, you weren't there for us. Thank you very much. And uh, it is well known that you have been supporting us from the beginning and we have done so much uh, progress together. And uh, it's been always a pleasure to, to have you and a pleasure to, to work with you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, no, no need to mention it, Sad. No need to mention it. It's our pleasure. Sad, we want to stay there. <laughs> For many years to come. <laughs> Henry, we might we might be moving into yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sad, thank you very much for those kind words. And of course, you know, um, your your input and enthusiasm, Kenneth and John, is, is priceless. 
um, you know, you have been such inspirations to to Saad and Stephen and Brahim and and the whole uh, Straits of Gibraltar Association uh, to make the Duke of Edinburgh in Tangier the success that it has become already. And we look forward to the next one. Um, oh, there's Stephen asking a question. Kenneth, John, my two greatest supporters since I first met them with my vision to start an office in Morocco to re-establish links between both cities. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Stephen, for, for your question. Uh, Henry, Henry, I think yes. it's important that we realize that we, we, we go back and learn from history. Okay? And... and uh, and it is vitally important because look, at the end of the day, in the, the history of Gibraltar, whenever things have been, uh, shall we say, sour between, um, you know, uh, Gibraltar, Britain and Spain or whatever, um, the, Gibraltar has always had to look to Morocco for its support uh, during sieges, wars. Uh, and I mean, let's not forget the... the what was it at the time? Ten thousand Moroccan workers who came to Gibraltar in uh, the nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies, who actually came here to work. Yes, they came here to to earn a better standard of living than than most people in Morocco at the time. No, but oh, we also have to appreciate it that without them, we would have been very, very stuck and in a serious problem. And we do have to be grateful for them. Absolutely. No? And, and unfortunately. If I can make a uh, quasi-political statement, no? it's the fact that... As if I could uh, stop you. <laughs> no, I'm going I'm to make a statement anyway. <laughs> so, uh, um, unfortunately, some of these people have been treated very badly as well. No? Yeah, no thankfully, nowadays, things are, are better for them. But uh, at the beginning, it, it, they had a hard life and they weren't treated particularly well shall I say, no? Yeah? yeah. Uh, and I think we owe them a debt of gratitude. So absolutely, I, I don't know what John thinks about what I'm going to say or yourself, no? But as far as I'm concerned, the work that I do in Morocco is me personally thanking these people for what they did for me. Absolutely. Yeah? Might, so might sound corny, but that's how I feel. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you're preaching to the converted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The times that you were back here in Jib not very long ago, it was just as the pandemic was ending and the ferry was restarting again, but it hadn't restarted yet. And we had uh, we had a concentration of people, Russian people in the theater, and you came along to the BBC mic, you know, you were telling our government to do something about it. You know. I, I was one of five Gibraltarians in that demonstration mm -hmm. and I was ashamed, I mm -hmm. was ashamed that day to be a Gibraltarian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, many Moroccans as well, you know, they, they've been working here for so many years and it took them the good part of about 20 to 25 years to get nationalized and, and to get a local passport as well, you know, and and they are one of us, you know, they've been living here for such a long time, they, they, they've born and bred their kids here now, you know, and I will never stop, you know, being grateful mm. for what they did for Well, I, I'll, I'll go further than that. I will never stop fighting their corner, because yeah. it's something I've done all my life, Absolutely. in my profession, mm. in my private capacity, and now in my retirement, both Priscilla and I continue to do the same. Yeah, well, Gentlemen, yeah. let, let me throw a question at you. And that is, you know, out of all the countries that you've traveled, and I know you both traveled extensively, your favorite country and why? Wow. wow, wow, wow. Oh, Henry. Another... Go ahead, John. John. No, I'll tell you. But, uh, John, you go ahead first. Uh, partly because of its of its culture, its rich in history, its food as well, you know, and because I am of Italian descent, you know. But then again, you know, I would never leave out Morocco because of what I explained before, because of my mom living there for eight years, its traditions, its food, 
It's the perfect scenario for hiking and trekking and organizing events of this sort, you know? So I would say these two. Okay. And you, Kenneth? Uh, Mira, um, the two countries that I really like uh, in all my travels, no? Um, one has got to be Costa Rica, which has amazing scenery and the geography of the place is incredible. Yeah, uh, because uh, when I visited Costa Rica, for example, one in one occasion we were actually uh, staying next to what is a dormant volcano, right? which as a geographer you can imagine wow. to me is. Uh, something I, I quite like to do, no? And then from that to the the coastline and the richness and unspoiled coastline that they have, no? Just so one little anecdote for you, just a little... And, you know, I, I used to tell the, the, the kids in school that I had written the Cardona book of uh, useless information, no? Really? <laughs> and one of the one of the things that is, I think the, the viewers might want to know, when well, anyway, is the fact that Costa Rica is the only nation in the world which does not have an army. Wow. <laughs> it does not have an army, eh? Okay? Which is something significant, but well, bueno, anyway, that goes to show the maybe the the kind of cultural mentality of the people there we don't need an army no or whatever but and the other place which i was very impressed with and has very bad uh, shall i say press in the world what is an amazing place to visit is cuba yeah and i'm not saying of going to the the baradero region of cuba where most of the tourists go but actually to go to havana no, the, the, real Cuba. the real Cuba, and yeah. I mentioned about the, the 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 sort of the warmth and the hospitality that I find in Morocco, no, and I had that kind of sensation in Cuba as well, you know. Eke, Henry, one of the things that I have learned in my life is that the people who have the less are the people who give you the most. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, the, 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 uh, some people I've met in my travels and in my life are people who have probably lived from hand to mouth, but they will be happily share whatever they have with you, you know. In other places, you have two loaves of bread and you want both of them. You're not prepared to give one or a little bit to somebody else, no? If you, if you can see what I mean about that, yeah? Yeah. Gentlemen, how do you balance what you do with family life? Uh, well, <laughs> because you're both married, you both have children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no matter, uh, Henry. My my children, my daughter, who is now 29, lives with her boyfriend, or has lived with her boyfriend for the last three years. My son is uh, somewhere around scrounging in the fridge at the moment <laughs> okay but uh, he's 26 and he's already in employment uh, we'll see how how that goes anyway no eventually i suppose he'll be moving out um in terms of my wife i think you know my wife and you probably vouch for the fact that we are um and I have to use an expression in Spanish, no? Una caja bomba. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, please elaborate. Please elaborate. elaborate. Well, no. Let's say that uh, when my wife and I go out, we go out. And when we go to a party, we go to party. Okay? We don't go like the, the famous expression says to stand around in the kitchen no we are in it in the thick of it really uh, and, and we sort of complement each other in that way no but okay uh, at the same time we've been married now for 32 years henry we appreciate what well, we get along magnificently because sometimes we also need a little bit of space you know so I do my things, and she does her things, but then we do things together. And, together, and that's the yeah. balance, really, you know, you know? Uh, a little bit of space, do things together, and then when she's 
sick of me. I go away for a couple of days so that she can have the, the, the double bed by herself. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> John, the ball is in your court. Well, I, I retired back in 2018 at the tender age of 56. <laughs> uh, and I have quite a bit of time in my hands now. So I divide my time between the care of the of my dad, who lives on his own and he's 89 now, and my wife, Paulette, who needs no introduction to you. She runs Absolutely. The Divorce Academy of Dance. Yeah. And, and my son, John, who works for the Divorce Football Association. So we're, we're a small but very close family and we complement each other, you know. And and we're reasonably independent as well, you know, we, we, we do our own thing, you know, and, and give ourselves space as well. We have a question now from our president, Brahim Krikas, and he says, we must acknowledge that Mr. Kenneth and John, uh, John been the believers of bringing Morocco and Gibraltar together since the day one. Much support we have received from the both and still, dear guests, tell us about you. To build the missing bridge since the borders reopened with Spain and Mount Galpe stopped. Since what the borders you... reopened with Spain mm. and Mount Galpe stopped. I think it means mm. Mons Galpe stopped. Mm. What lessons to be learned from losing the links with Morocco? Well, no, Mira, apart from the fact that having links with people, uh, not only with Morocco, but with any other place, no, is enriching to anyone. No, I'm a, a, a firm believer that travel enriches the mind. Okay. Um, it, it's, I, I think, to be honest with you, that the, that the fact that there is no links, direct links with Morocco and uh, Gibraltar as a present is, is not so much a problem for me, but it is a problem for many members of the Moroccan community who are unfortunately... Actually, let, it... me, let me correct you because there is. There is a ferry now every two weeks that does mm -hmm. Tangier and Gibraltar. The, the ferry we do, have, the... a, we do okay. have a direct link with a ferry mm. that mm. runs every two weeks. Yeah, uh, Henry, I had the experience of going on that ferry once. Okay? Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, I was with John at the time and it was so chaotic, <laughs> chaotic, that we swore never to do it again. Yeah. Right? Henry, and just for the benefit of the, the listener or the viewer, um, I was working at the time and we were told that the ferry would be leaving Gibraltar at half past five in the afternoon. Okay. So I finished work at 3.30, rushed home, got the bags and what have you. We were going hiking at the time. So imagine I had to take quite a bit of stuff. You know? it, when we got there, the ferry was not there. There was no information. There was no nothing you know people were kept waiting and waiting and waiting nobody came out and said Mira, this is the problem there's a delay or whatever i mean there, there were no facilities in terms of uh, toilet facilities nothing to eat whatever eventually i think the ferry turned up in gibraltar at about quarter past 11 in the evening by the time it got to tangier uh, i believe it was about one o'clock in the morning, you know. I have experienced that myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally so inhumane. See, totally see. inhumane. I was disgusted. Totally Henry. inhumane. I was yeah. disgusted, really, and and I was disgusted with the attitude of the attitude of the people who were highly paid to be servants of the community. Really, no. Yes. And sorry, I don't want to. But the attitude of some of the policemen there, I had a plan, you know, what are you talking about, man? There's hundreds of people here with no information, nothing here, you know, can't you do something about it? Can't you find out something? But let me, let me add, let me add that I have experienced the same thing on the Tangier end, where mm -hmm. I've had a ticket for a ferry at nine o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and the ferry has not left until an hour and a half later, 
Ah, bueno. and nobody makes any announcements as to what the delay sí, is sí, 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 or sí. what the problem is or what mm. time it might leave. It, it happened I, to I us. Think, I think mm. it may be a cultural thing. It happened to us the last time that we went, John. Vale? If you remember, I think we had agreed to get, I think it was the 11 o'clock ferry. Yeah, the 11 o'clock ferry, which didn't actually leave until about quarter of 20 past 12 or algo senior. And again, nobody tells you, no. mira, uh, there's been a delay for technical reasons or whatever, you know. Uh, I mean, informing, informing the people about these things helps in the sense that then uh, uh, people will be naturally patient if they know what the problem is. But if you're just sitting in the boat for an hour and a bit and nobody tells you anything, what happens is people get frustrated and uh, it creates problems rather than solves yeah. them, you know? Yeah? Yeah. Hmm? Absolutely. Henry, yeah. with that in your heart, do you think that a ferry every fortnight is good enough? And I don't think it's good enough. You know, but on the other hand, the the company that runs a ferry is running a business and not a charitable organization, which yeah. is why the the, the 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 air link between Morocco and Gibraltar was discontinued. Although they used the COVID excuse to stop it, but it yeah. was never re-established because they said that they were losing money t since 2017. <laughs> now right. I can say that I have been on that flight, and there's only been four people on the flight. Yeah, you know, so it's it's a catch twenty two situation. Mm -hmm. I also have to say that those flights were never advertised, so yeah. there were still people in Gibraltar that had no idea that we had direct flights with Morocco. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's just one of those things. Uh, that, I, mean, uh, Henry, I think I think if we went back to the situation where we had uh, pre pandemic, where at least there was two flights a week on the Thursday and the Sunday which was very convenient, no? uh, not only for anybody who was going like we were, which are essentially tourists, no? yep. uh, but also for the, the local Moroccan population. Okay, what let, let, me, not... let me add... Oops, I don't know. Oopsie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the heat, he'll be back in a moment, uh, John. Yeah? yeah. Okay, me, meanwhile, talk about amongst yourselves. <laughs> No, sorry. Mm -mm. Can't, hear. Can't hear you, Henry. Can't hear you. I cannot hear you. No. Bueno, John, since we are talking about um, amongst ourselves, like I said, uh, we need to speak to Saad at some point in time to try and organize our next shall we say venture across no and um, can you hear me hello you can't hear me no he's going out again and coming back no i'm asking you can you hear me of course i can yes yeah, ah vale okay we are the only two mm -hmm. yep <laughs> bueno <laughs> sorry que i'm thirsty you can drink water if you want. Yeah, see you when. I'm back, gentlemen. When, uh, the, welcome this back. is what we call the genes of Tangier. <laughs> eh? The demons of Tangier. Because okay. today has been one of those days when I've kept losing both of you and you probably kept losing me, but we've managed mm. to come back. Mm. Mm. I've been fine, Henry, to be honest with you. I'm on my laptop and, and I'm not having any problems whatsoever. I've kept I've kept losing both of you. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Might be John, because there's too many people. John, we've it, lost John now. Yeah, we've lost John now. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, I think we need to round it up. We've actually mm -hmm. gone past the time speculated, which was four minutes. Mm -hmm. It has been a pleasure to have both of you. And I'd like to thank... Uh, oh, there's John coming back. Yes. John's back. I'm here. I, I was just saying, John, that it's been a pleasure having both of you uh, on this cultural exchange. Uh, carry on doing the amazing work that you're both doing. We will. Sad, when is the next one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that as soon as he has a date, 
you two will be the first uh, that he will inform. Uh, but I'm sure before that, there'll be the uh, awards ceremony to present the, the youngsters with their uh, uh, well earned well, certificates. Yeah, yeah. Gentlemen, it with... has been a pleasure to host you both live here from the Casbah in Tangier. And I look forward to hosting the next one very soon. So God bless you both. Stay safe. It's Thank been a pleasure, Henry. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you very guys. much for inviting me. Okay.